Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for checking out my show, Coin Stories, where I get to hear from the leading voices in Bitcoin, financial markets and investing, political structures, philosophy, and more. Please make sure you're subscribed to the show. And if you're watching this on YouTube, like the video so more people see it and hit that notifications button so you don't miss out on any new content. This podcast does not provide financial advice. It is for educational and entertainment purposes only. So make sure to do your own research before making any investment decision and be aware of your risk tolerance. I'm able to produce this show thanks to my sponsors, and I'm very picky about who I choose to partner with. So I hope you take the time to listen to the ad reads throughout the show. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the show. We have a very special treat. Today, I am joined by Colonel Douglas McGregor. He is a decorated veteran, the author of five groundbreaking books on military transformation. He holds a PhD in international relations, and he is a highly respected expert on defense and foreign policy. He was also the senior advisor to the Secretary of Defense in the Trump administration. So, Colonel McGregor, thank you so much for joining me. Sure. Well, you have been remarkably accurate with your analysis and predictions, especially covering Ukraine. And you have said that the war will likely end with Russia controlling all of eastern Ukraine, if not all of Ukraine. And we're starting to see a more accurate picture emerge in the media about what's really happening. So can you kind of summarize what you believe will happen next in Ukraine and why it's important to ordinary Americans? Yeah, well, I think it is very important to Americans to know the truth. And the truth has been very unpopular uh, for quite a while. Don't want to cover too much history, but this war has been brewing for well over a decade. Some people would argue for at least 20, 25 years because of the unwillingness in the West to look at the reality that the way the map is drawn of Ukraine it, it is inaccurate, frankly. Uh, there there are Ukrainians, true Ukrainians, uh, but they did not live in Crimea. It's never been part of Ukraine. And most of the area that we call the Donbass, the Donetsk Basin, is really Russian, and the people that live there are Russian. And the easy way is to go back and look at the electoral maps showing how people voted over the last, uh, you know, previous elections. You see that the East is overwhelmingly voting in favor of the pro-Russian candidate, and the West, which is on the other side of the Dnieper River, is usually voting overwhelmingly for the anti-Russian candidate, whoever that happens to be. So there, there was always a need to address this. And I had argued for a plebiscite. Other people argued for it. I also always felt very strongly that it was in Ukraine's interest to be a neutral state that it could be much like Austria, and like Austria, could profit enormously from its neutrality. And this, this of course, was sabotaged by uh, first the Bush administration, then subsequently uh, Obama. Uh, and I think that Trump was subverted by his own Secretary of State and Secretary of Defense and his, his entire national security team, who all wanted to press ahead with this expansion of NATO and incorporate Ukraine. So I think... President Trump was left sort of standing there without anybody supporting him and then found himself out of office. And it wasn't long thereafter that Putin gave up because he said, there's no one I can talk to. There's no one who will negotiate with me. I'm left no choice. Because what we did after 2014 was build this enormous uh, Ukrainian military power uh, that was designed to attack Russia, frankly, from eastern Ukraine. Ukrainians said they wanted to get back Crimea. We said, fine. And uh, they wanted to punish the Russians living in uh, Dohansk, uh, Luhansk and Donetsk for being Russians and not converting to become 100% Ukrainian, speaking Ukrainian, and so forth, so on. So bottom line is you get this war. And from the very beginning, I think uh, Putin made uh, some miscalculations. He thought that if he demonstrated how serious he was and his country was about the growing threat to Russia in eastern Ukraine— that we would pay attention to him. <laughs> well, we did, but we decided to double down on the threat that we were creating. And his great fear was that in addition to this Ukrainian army, that of course, theater ballistic missiles would show up that would put his entire nuclear deterrent as well as all of his major cities at risk. So he, he marched in and initially it was a, a very cautious approach designed to do as little damage as possible, kill as few people as possible. And it took really almost until the summer to figure out there's nobody out there. Nobody's going to talk to us. Nobody's going to negotiate. We're stuck. We're going to have to change our entire approach. And so we go into this uh, long haul uh, uh, approach 
which is uh, basically a 30-month plan for a 30-month war. And that's what he adopted in the summer. We've had this massive Russian military buildup to the point now where we have what Biden and his supporters said he didn't want, which is this large and powerful Russian military power sitting on NATO's eastern border. In other words, he went in theoretically to protect NATO, and he got the opposite. And NATO is rapidly falling apart. And we see from these leaked documents that have come out the tremendous disunity inside the NATO alliance. And in, and for your purposes, I'm sure your listeners know that uh, one of the fatal mistakes that we made was to assume that Russia was this economically weak, backward power. I think someone put it, was it McCain, who said Russia's a gas station with nucle- nuclear weapons? That's right. Well, they discovered they could not be more wrong. So Russia has an abundance of resources and energy, of course, which makes it the perfect partner for China that needs all of that to continue to sustain its economic expansion. And we've ended up on the on the wrong side in the sense that we're suffering economically. Our European allies are suffering very, very acutely from, from this war and from all these self-defeating sanctions. Well, I was actually going to go there next. In Ukraine, we seem to have made financial sanctions the centerpiece of our military strategy, weaponizing the dollar. And economic sanctions were a useful weapon, you know, decades ago, but the world has evolved to really neutralize them. So what implications do Western financial sanctions failing so visibly have in the geopolitical sphere here? Well, keep in mind that for many, many decades, we've used our command of the uh, World Bank and uh, other financial centers because effectively the dollar dominates everything. We not only pass on our debt to others by compelling everybody else to use the dollar, but the the institutions, global institutions use the dollar because it's convenient. And what we've done is we've effectively bullied so many people for so long that many are now saying, well, Russia's got a point. China's got a point. Why should we do business constantly in the dollar? Now, this doesn't mean that the, the so-called reserve currency is going to go to go away instantly, but I think it's in serious trouble. So this de-dollarization is very serious at this point. We shouldn't underestimate it. But I think we brought it on ourselves. If you constantly beat people over the head with, as you say, this weapon, this financial weapon, eventually they come back and say, we've had it. I mean, people living in Honduras or Costa Rica or Southeast Asia and Thailand have been told If you want our assistance, our support, then grow these crops. Crops, imagine that, being told what crops you will grow and and so forth. It's gotten really out of hand. The sanctions are just another manifestation of this. And frankly, all the sanctions that we've imposed on Russia have turned out to be undercut anyway. So the oil and the gas, along with rare earths and every other conceivable mineral and foodstuffs, all those things are seeping out one way or the other. it's, It's kind of... You know, if you pass a law in the United States, and it's a fundamentally flawed law, whatever it happens to be, it's a law that everyone opposes, and people really don't want to obey it, ultimately what happens? It's meaningless, because over time, the police decide not to enforce it because they can't. Well, that's largely what's happened to us and our financial dominance on the planet. Well, you know, something I've talked about many times on this show is that every fiat currency has failed. Some lasted months, some a century, but all have failed. And we depegged from gold in the 1970s. We continue to print these paper promises. We spend more than we take in. We're net consumers, whereas all these countries that we have tensions with are net producers. So where does the dollar go from here? You said it it won't be the re- reserve. <clears throat> it won't lose that status very quickly. But, you know, did these sanctions accelerate losing that status? Yes. Yeah, I think they contribute enormously to it. You know, I I really wish that uh, I could drag my son into this discussion. He's a brilliant financial analyst, and he's someone I pay attention to, and I've listened to him for years, which is why I'm heavily invested in uh, digital currency, because uh, he's pointed out that we're, we're really on a path to one of two destinations right now. One destination, of course, is, well, the Fed will just print money. And that's the widespread assumption. They'll, they'll continue to print and print and print. What's to stop us? Well, there are a lot of things that can stop you from printing more money, not the least of which is something called hyperinflation. We've been down that road before. We could turn to Weimar, to the Weimar Republic in the interwar period. They're, they're talk about Argentina. We go in any number of different places and find it. So that's one destination. The other destination is that at some point, no one's buying your treasuries 
And when nobody's buying your treasuries and you can no longer buy them all up, and even worse, other countries begin to dump your treasuries, China, Japan, Saudi Arabia, and so forth, you have to restructure your debt. It's called defaulting. Now, people say, oh, we've never defaulted. Well, that's a lot of nonsense. In 32 and 34, we did. We called it restructuring our debt. Now, restructuring the debt is very painful, as you know. And as my son points out to me all the time, credit's going to dry up. And you're going to have to live without credit for some period of time. I mean, it's going to be hell on earth for people that are accustomed to essentially relentless financial expansion. But the other problem we face that no one ever discusses is this financialization of our economy. That's right. What do we build? What do we produce? Well, we produce a lot of military equipment and technology, but there's a problem with that. It's not much return on investment, which is why anybody with any sense like President Eisenhower was always trying to keep defense expenditures to what he considered to be the acceptable minimum. In other words, you want to maintain the security of your country. He wasn't interested in being the policeman of the world, obviously. And he didn't like all of these alliances, but he set them up in a way that made them unambiguously defensive. And when, for instance, Austria wanted to become neutral, he welcomed it. In fact, Eisenhower said, we should try to neutralize more countries in Europe because we simply can't defend them all. Well, his wise words and wise counsel have been largely abandoned. So now, then here's the last problem. In addition to having sort of built the empire that we can't afford, much like the British did, and then run ourselves into bankruptcy, where do you put your store of wealth? How do you preserve it? And I think digital currency is one of those options. And in fact, it may be, I I shouldn't make these kinds of predictions, but of course, John Kenneth Galbraith, who once said that uh, economic forecasting exists to make astrologers look professional. Uh, So I feel like I can make an economic forecast since uh, I think Galbraith was right. I have a feeling that digital currency over time may well replace most of the fiat currency. Do you think that Bitcoin could serve as a global reserve currency? I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm in over my head and everyone out there will say, well, you didn't go to the Wharton School. That's true. Now, my grandfather went to the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. Both of my grandfathers went to Penn, but it doesn't help me. Uh, I, 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 I didn't. I'm not a business school graduate, uh, although I have lots of people telling me not to worry about it. Uh, but that's never, you know, that's another issue. But the bottom line is, I, I don't know, but I think digital currency mm-hmm. that cannot be controlled and manipulated through a central banking system is something that's very, very appealing to people. Now, beyond that, I don't know. I wish I had, I wish I could make more profound predictions for you, but I can't. But I think that's real. I mean, isn't everyone sick of the banking system's manipulation of wealth and power? How many, for how many years have we gone through this? And then somebody says, well, when the Fed was established in the United States, uh, in the intervening years, we're down to 10%, the dollars at 10% of, of what it was worth in what, 1911? It's incomprehensible. So I think there's a desire for something else. There's no question about it. And I think digital currency has a bright future. Beyond that, I can't say too much. Right. I definitely agree that we need a parallel system. I think a lot of the the policymakers use Bitcoin as an invisibility cloak. They make it look like the threat when actually they don't want to admit that their own policies are what got us here. Um, and if we lose the dollar's reserve status, you know, we won't be able to s- sustain these trillion dollar deficits part of which go to fund the military, right? So things will need to change. The military budget will have to come down to something reasonable for the size of our economy. I know that right now from sources within the military, they're still basing budgets on 2% CPI and not accounting for the increase in inflation. Entitlements will be affected. So how do you see this really playing out? Well, there are three things that uh, your, your viewers need to understand. First of all, Money into defense does not necessarily produce capability on the other end. Just spending money doesn't equal capability. We spend far too much for what we get in most cases. In some cases, we spend a great deal, and we do get a good return on investment. I I think that's particularly true in surveillance, intelligence, reconnaissance, platforms, and capabilities. But many other areas, we simply don't. So that's the first problem. Second problem is that, you know, you're... Current military establishment remains, tragically, 
a brilliant tribute to the Second World War. We're still building surface fleets around aircraft carrier battle groups. We're still fielding large, ponderous army divisions that are too heavy to move, too heavy to lift. But even worse, the world doesn't fight that way anymore. And that's one of the things that we have to pay attention to what's been happening in Ukraine, because it fundamentally changes the way you look at things. That's that's a huge problem. And then you've got the, the threat inflation industry. You, you want to keep this monstrous military establishment running, and you keep insisting it's vitally necessary because if anything isn't spent for 10 cents less or 10 billion less, you're at risk of being conquered and overrun and destroyed. By whom? Well, we go back to Russia. Russia presents no substantial threat to us unless, of course, we decide to attack Russia. They have an enormous nuclear arsenal. We have an enormous nuclear arsenal. We can kill each other and most of the people on the planet several times over. We don't want to use nuclear weapons. I see no evidence that Mr. Putin does. That So that that's kind of a dumb way to look at it. Secondly, we continue to see Russia through the Cold War lens. Everyone keeps acting as though it's the Soviet Union. It's not. Russia is a very different country today. China you know, people can go, the Communist Party of China is doing this and this. The Communist Party of China. The Communist Party of China is a joke. The Communist Party of China is just an elite organization, a, a, a cabal of people across the country that run the government and, and try to control 1.4 billion people, which is pretty damn difficult to do. They're not communists. I haven't seen very many communists in Northeast Asia whenever I've been over there to visit. The Chinese are money-grubbing people, let's face it. They're, they, they are absolutely committed to profit at all costs. So I don't see much evidence for, ca uh, for communism. I see a lot of evidence for capitalism. But I don't see evidence for Chinese armies massing on anybody's border to invade anybody. And when they look at their naval power, remember a third of all the ships that they have floating around uh, in the South China Sea are Coast Guard vessels. So, all right, what, what are we really dealing with? Are we really genuinely facing existential threats from China and Russia? And I think the president last night said it very well. He said, no. He said, our problems are here at home. And they are. So you have this group of people in Washington who seem to be ready to do anything to sustain these massive outlays in spending, not just defense, but also in entitlements, as you know, and we continue to pretend as though the social security system, Medicare, Medicaid, pension plans, all these things are, are solid. They're not. We know they're not. We pretend that the banks are solvent and not illiquid. They're not. I mean, these, remember back, I think it was December or November last year, all of these, uh, what was it, stress tests were run on banks. There was like, oh, well, we're in pretty good shape. That wasn't true. Right. We are continuing to mislead ourselves in order to sustain this tremendous spending. Well, when does it stop? Well, I think, what was it, Ben Stein who said things go on until they can't? Mm -hmm. When did the British stop. leave India? When their debt-to-GDP ratio was 240%? In other words, I, I'm afraid that the, the so-called ruling elites in Washington, D.C. are just going to drive us into the ground. And I hope that before then, if I have to choose between hyperinflation and default in terms of restructuring the debt, I'd rather go with the restructuring as opposed to hyperinflation. But they're all going to be painful. And no one wants to tell the American people the truth. Just what? as these documents have come out and told us we're losing in Ukraine, the Ukrainians are not going to win, Ukraine is being destroyed. We have the same problem at home. Our financial system is being destroyed by us. It's time for a quick break to hear these messages from my partners. All right, now to my first partner, where I buy my Bitcoin, Swan. I partnered with Swan because it is a Bitcoin-only company focused on helping people save for their future and self-custody their Bitcoin, not trade it. You can start a direct deposit to take advantage of Bitcoin as a savings technology and learn how to take it off the exchange. Swan's mission is to educate 10 million future Bitcoiners through free resources and media projects like Hard Money. Swan also offers retirement planning with an IRA, tax loss harvesting, home equity conversion, and a white glove private client service. I use Swan to dollar cost average every day. That's right. I deposit a little bit every day that's equivalent to what I might spend on a meal so that I add to my future nest egg and lower my yearly cost basis. 
To learn more and get $10 in free Bitcoin when you sign up, head to swanbitcoin.com slash Natalie Brunel. Next up, Fold. Fold is the best Bitcoin rewards debit card and shopping app in the world. You can earn Bitcoin on everything you purchase from Amazon to groceries to sprucing up your wardrobe with Fold's Bitcoin cashback debit card. And you can win free Satoshis every day or even play for the chance to win a whole Bitcoin by spinning the daily wheel and the purchase rewards wheel. And now on Fold, you can buy Bitcoin directly and earn even more incentives and rewards by using the app to stack sats. It's an amazing app to get someone totally new into Bitcoin. So if you want to join the fun, head to foldapp.com slash Natalie and get 10,000 in free sats when you sign up. Well, let's talk a little bit more about China. First of all, what do you make of the meeting between President Xi Jinping and President Emmanuel Macron of France? And what does that mean for geopolitics, given everything you've just covered? Well, when you see President Xi stop thinking about communism, forget that, and think of him as the contemporary emperor of China. China is an empire unto itself, much as we are on the North American continent, frankly. But China is an imperial state not with goals and objectives to conquer the world because they've got 1.4 billion people. They've got enough. You know, as a Japanese commander, after a couple of years in China in the 1930s, turned to the, the emperor and said, you know, the problem in China is there's nothing in it but Chinese. In other words, what are we doing here? This is crazy. And the Japanese were trying to get out. The point is that Xi looks at Macron and sees Macron as a potential trading partner. Remember, China's focus is to the, the restoration of this thing called the Silk Road. Right. And you have several sort of lines of communication that run across the map. They all run through Central Asia. Some run down south through uh, what we used to call Persia, Iran, or into Turkey and then the Middle East. But most of them really are from Northeast Asia, from Shanghai to Beijing, all the way to Rochefort in France on the Atlantic coast. Now, why is this so important? It's important because we have the most powerful submarine fleet in the world. We may have a shrinking surface fleet, but surface fleets don't fight battles and win wars the way they did 100, 100, 200 years ago. Today, everything is a function of the submarine at sea, its ability to essentially neutralize you, put you out of business. Nothing comes in, nothing goes out of a port if we decide to put a submarine out there at sea. And you have the overhead surveillance, which is connected to everything on the ground and connected to all sorts of platforms. So this is readily available as a tool for us. If we decided to shut down Chinese ports, we could do it. China knows that and has known that for a very long time. They went through this with the Royal Navy back in the 1840s and, and even earlier. So what have the Chinese concluded? Well, we need to bypass the maritime route to the extent that we can. And they're very dependent on it. They will be for many years to come through the Strait of Malacca up into the South China Sea. Food, energy, through that strait up into China. But if you build this network across Central Asia that reaches to Europe, that's a game changer because Russia has all the energy in the world that you could possibly need. So if you're suddenly cut off, you've got it. Russia has most of the food that you're going to need to eat as well, along with Ukraine, you look at that entire area, it's it's a food production center on a scale that very few people in the West appreciate. There's a reason, you know, we used to call it Ukraine, the breadbasket of Europe. So the bottom line is, this is a very important development, this One Belt, One Road project. And the Europeans, of course, want to trade with China. Well, why wouldn't they? I mean, China's the biggest market in the world, or one of the biggest, this, this is inevitable, and we're sitting there trying to stop it. Are we nuts? The answer is yes, of course. But we've also missed our opportunity because we have an advantage over the Chinese. When the Chinese want to move across Central Asia, they've got to go through multiple countries, multiple states, where people speak multiple languages, have different laws and customs. And as you move through each state, everybody has their hand out and says, please, uh, Money, please, because you're going to go through this. We have missed the opportunity to build something right across North America, from the Atlantic coast to the Pacific coast. We could outpace China or anybody else in Asia anytime we wanted to if we had fast sea lift in the Pacific, fast sea lift in the Atlantic, and speedy trains right across 
North America. And what, what else? It's secure. One language, one law, one people, one nation. Faster, cheaper, better. What have we done? Nothing. Well, it looks like instead we're just moving in that same direction of more intimidation, raising tensions. You've said in interviews before that China doesn't want war with us and that our leaders in Washington do not understand the priorities of leaders like Xi, their cultures, their people. So what do you think should happen next versus what do you think will happen and what's really at stake here with China? Well, what we should let's talk about what we should understand about both Taiwan and China because they both have the same aspirations, the same goals, frankly. Chinese everywhere want to live in a society, in a state, in a world that looks like Singapore. Now, what's interesting about Singapore? Well, most Americans would go to Singapore, look around and live there for a couple of days, be horrified. Everything in Singapore is really controlled by the government. You know, you, you're not going to just show up in Singapore, buy uh, 20 acres and build something. Uh, effectively, the government leases everything to you. And they have very strict laws and regulations governing everything. But what do they not do? Well, they don't tax you to death, per se. In other words, if you're wealthy enough to get there to begin with, they're not going to steal it from you. But they pro provide you with a marketplace, whereas from the Chinese vantage point, which is ideal, no one interferes with you. No one bothers you. You have the freedom to enrich yourself. And that's very important to most Chinese. Remember, China is a part of the world where people have died by the millions from all sorts of famines and problems over many, many centuries. They just want to live unencumbered by the government and do business. Now, they also have a huge problem with corruption, much greater than we in the United States understand. Someone told me the other day they estimated that on Taiwan alone, there are probably 100 gangsters with connections to Japan, Korea, and China. So the corruption is a huge problem. And Xi may control many things, but he can't even control the corruption inside China. He can't stop everything from moving on any given day. I mean, he's, he's limited just by the size and scope of the country. So the point is, no, they don't, they don't want war with us. They don't want war with anybody. They just want to do business. But the Singapore model is really what both Taiwanese and Chinese want. Now, we can't conceive of that. So we project our views, our values, our mentality onto them. And the outcome is this utterly misleading view that China is armed to the teeth and can't wait to invade Taiwan. For your listeners out there, look, Taiwan is hell to invade. They have very few beaches where you can land, and they're very small. You're talking about sheer rock face around most of the island's edges. It's very difficult to reach, difficult to get on board. And by the way, the Chinese don't want to destroy what's on Taiwan. They want to do business with it. They have investments there. And they're, the Taiwanese are heavily invested in China. So all of this war business just needs to stop. And I think if we shut up and get out of the way, this will sort itself out over the next several years. But in Asia, of course, things take time. We, we're the insta, instant pudding world, which is insane. We want everything immediately. In Asia, it may be 10 years, maybe 20 years. Xi said that they were looking at 2040 or 2043 or 2046 as reunification with the people on Taiwan. It'll probably happen. You know, I've been reading more and more about Taiwan because it is increasingly in the news. And there are some out there speculating that after generations of fighting wars over oil, the next wars are going to be fought over chips in this digital world. And TSM, that's the Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing, they control about 90% of production of silicon chips. And so, you know, we're seeing the tone of media reports changing about China and Taiwan. It's becoming more dramatic. So is it possible, Colonel McGregor, knowing the influence of our intelligence agencies over the media and over politicians, that the U.S. is maybe trying to scare Taiwan and we are raising the tension and the temperature to incentivize them to move their chip technology to the U.S. because we don't want to tolerate China eventually having a monopoly over that industry? Well, a couple of points. First of all, remember, Japan and South Korea are equally dependent upon that microcircuitry being produced in uh, Taiwan. And if you look, look at Taiwan from a purely economic standpoint, Taiwan and South Korea are both largely extensions in economic terms of 
Japan. Now, the hatchet has been buried between Japan and China. We keep assuming that somehow or another, the Japanese will jump on board with us and help us fight the Chinese. Nothing could be further from the truth. The Chinese have opened their markets to Japan. And one of the principal reasons for conflict over the last several hundred years between Japan and China was the unwillingness of the Chinese to open their markets unless the Japanese paid tribute to the Chinese emperor. Well, the Japanese said, no, we don't pay tribute to anybody, and you've got lots of wars. Everybody else in Asia essentially paid a fee to get into the Chinese market. Well, Xi very wisely has said that's over because that's been the source of war and conflict in Asia for hundreds of years. So now you've got the Japanese that are keenly interested in their access to Taiwan, along with the South Koreans. And here we come along. And, and how long have we stood around since the 1980s? I mean, this business of shipping jobs and industries overseas began under President Reagan. Nobody ever points that out. It took, it got started in the 80s, and it really went uh, in high gear during the 90s under Clinton. Remember Clinton saying, well, the jobs aren't coming back. Well, it's just not coming back. Well, we didn't do what the Germans did or the Japanese or others and say, wait a minute, we're not going to allow X number of manufacturers, X number of factories, X number of whatever in our production base to go overseas. President Trump tried very hard and came to an agreement with the firm on Taiwan that produces these microchips. And he wanted to build a facility in Arizona. And that, you know, he said, we'll, we'll give you whatever you know, breaks are required tax-wise. We want to have a manufacturing facility here in the United States. We want to employ U.S. labor. Well, as soon as he was out of office, where did that go? Away. And all of a sudden now people are saying, we have to go to war to gain access to microchips. Well, that's insane. Everybody in Taiwan is going to be happy to sell you your micro circuitry. You don't have to go to war to get it. It's a friend of mine once said, Doug, why do Americans think they have to park a tank on top of the oil well to get at the oil? The Arabs will sell it to you. Saddam Hussein, whether you like him or not, would have sold you all the oil you wanted. So the bottom line is we got to get out of this 19th century mindset. We, we're not in the game. The game is not military. It's not, I have more of X than you do, and I can destroy you and so forth. That is, it's not part of the discussion. It's not in the strategic calculus. As far as Northeast Asia and the West are concerned, those are the two major poles of scientific industrial power and understanding in the world. There should be no war between us. It's unnecessary. Now, that doesn't mean we won't have problems elsewhere. But the point is, there's no need to go to war for microcircuitry. I think I heard this Representative McCall in Texas make some sort of stupid remark like that. Again, there's this underlying supposition that if you do something we don't like, you must be the enemy. Lots of people do things they don't. we don't like. We do lots of things other people don't like. doesn't make us enemies. Right. That's well said. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about where it's all going. Millennials are coming <clears throat> into power as sort of this next generation that's searching for answers to the <clears throat> problems that are impacting us, especially economically. It's why people like me have turned to things like Bitcoin. So what advice do you have for younger generations on how the U.S. should position itself? What is the ideal role for the U.S. and the U.S. military going forward? And can <clears throat> we accept a multipolar <clears throat> world? Well, as far as millennials are concerned, I, I hope the right millennials end up in charge because the millennials coming out of the Ivy Leagues and the service academies are all brainwashed into this globalist uh, world order nonsense. We've got to get out of that business. We've got to understand that we, we are not imposing order on the world. The world is always somewhat disorderly and will remain somewhat disorderly. That's not all bad. We are a participant in the world, but we don't control it, nor do we want to. It's a bankrupting exercise. Everybody who's tried hegemony has failed and ultimately ended up ruined in bankruptcy. So we don't want to do that anyway. Secondly, <clears throat> understand that we need to look at defense from the standpoint of defense. We need to get out of this business of intervening in other people's countries because of a particular lobby in the United States. And there are many, many lobbies, foreign lobbies in the United States, that are also connected to defense industries that have an interest in conflict because they want to sell their products. 
we've got to get control of this thing. And we need to scale back our investments in defense, but we need to invest more prudently and competently. You know, we have 44 four-star generals on active duty today. When I say generals or admirals, 44. And we have perhaps 1.1 million people in uniform. Now, at the height of the Second World War, when we had 12 million men in uniform, we had seven four-stars. Wow. What's wrong with this picture? Now, your millennials out there must have learned something in business school about uh, overhead and the tax that you pay for monstrous and unnecessary overhead. The overhead in American national defense is atrocious. It's outrageous. We have been busily hollowing out the military from year to year to year, the, the people who actually deploy and fight, and keeping all of the generals and adding to them. Again, every time there's an opportunity for an intervention, the Dep Defense Department comes across and says, well, you need more admirals, more generals to run the intervention. It's, it's crazy. So that we got to get control of that thing. And then we have to really focus on what do we need as opposed to what do we really, what do we want? In other words, there's always a wish list. Then there's a need list. We got to get back to what do we need? Do you really think we need 10,000 nuclear warheads? Are 5,000 nuclear warheads enough? Are 2,000 enough? I once had a French general tell me, Douglas, one warhead is enough. <laughs> In other words, Anybody who thinks you're going to use one warhead against them mm -hmm. scares the living hell out of them. And and by the way, that's appropriate because nuclear weapons are terrible, ruin life on Earth. Nobody wants to go there because Washington, D.C. is a money machine. And anyone who steps forward and says these things, and by the way, President Trump has said some of these things too, it threatens the money flow. We've got to stop it. We can't afford it. Right. We've enjoyed the privilege of that deficit without tears, right? We've been able to print, print, print. Our leaders only think as far as the next election cycle. Some of right. them can't think past 10 years because they're in their 80s. And people like me, we don't have a 10-year time horizon. We're looking out 40, 50 years. So, I mean, what do you think this country looks like several decades from now? Depends. The, the, the top priority for the United States in terms of national defense First and foremost, close the border. Stop the influx of millions of people for whom, frankly, we, we it's not a question of room. Everybody will say, well, we've got lots of space. We, we can't employ them. We can't absorb them and, re, and, per, and put them to good purpose and use. So that's the first thing. Second thing is we've got to restore the rule of law inside the United States. Anyone who comes from overseas tells you they love to do business in the United States because they don't have to pay the bribes to everyone in sight that is usually required around the world. But the rule of law has broken down in too much of our country. You know, so those are the two things that have to happen right away. The rule of law also means a lot of these people who have come here illegally are going to have to leave. That doesn't mean they can't come back legally. But where do we put them? Where do we house them? And if we're headed into a period of scarcity, as opposed to the enormous abundance that we've enjoyed, it's very dangerous to bring in millions of people that you look at and regard as foreigners. Because then the foreigner is seen as somebody taking your job, absorbing your benefits. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's a very dangerous situation. We haven't been thinking about any of these things because... We don't see the pain train that we're about to ride. All we've seen is the fun train, the party train. Get on, party away. There's plenty of coal left. The, end, the locomotive will keep running. Well, the locomotive is grinding slowly to a halt. It may not make it much longer. What do you do then? You have to start throwing people off the train. Right. We've taken advantage of our, our position as global reserve currency. We've exported much of our inflation. I know we're starting to run out of time, but I did want to ask you, President Trump has said publicly that if he were in office, he could end the Ukraine war in 24 hours. Do you have any insight on how he would do that? I mean, what's the best case scenario for extracting us from this situation at this point? Well, the first thing that I think uh, President Trump would do is that uh, he would send a message to President Putin and tell him that we are prepared to hold talks with him or his representatives 
without preconditions. And what have we always heard from Biden and from Zelensky? Well, all Russians have to leave Ukraine before we'll talk to anybody. All Russians must evacuate Crimea. I mean, it's like saying, telling the Israelis you must all commit ritual suicide to make you know millions of Muslim Arabs happy. Well, that's a lot of nonsense, right? So that's not going to work. So it has to be talks with, without preconditions. That's number one. Number two, neutrality is on the table. We'll, we'll accept neutrality for Ukraine. We don't need Ukraine in NATO. NATO is too big as it is. It's a huge, unwieldy monster. And by the way, NATO should have been Europeanized 30 years ago. Why are we still there paying the freight and paying for everything? It's, it's unnecessary. So those are two things right away that I think President Trump would say. No preconditions, neutrality, absolutely. Then the tough questions are, where do you draw the lines? And what kinds of assurances do you give the Russians that we will not come back in the future and do what we did from 2014 until 2023 or 2022? And that is build up the Ukrainian military establishment. Now, all of this assumes, of course, that if President Trump got in there, that Putin would take him seriously. I, I think he probably would. But remember, President Putin has also looked at us and said, well, you know, President Trump meant well the last time. President Trump was never an enemy of the Russian people. He's not an enemy of the Chinese people. He's not an enemy of any people. But it didn't matter, did it? Because the people that held appointments in his administration were committed to hostility mm -hmm. toward Russia, China, and elsewhere. So that's a huge problem. Who's he put in? He's got to have a completely new team. And then you're still dealing with this sort of greedy Congress, greedy Senate and House that wants money, 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 money. They, they've they become uh, addicted to the financialization of the economy. They want the transaction fees, just like the boys in the banks on Wall Street. They want to get their transaction fees. Well, that's the same thing true now in Washington, D.C. I often say the ideal president would probably be Oliver Cromwell, the Lord Protector of England, because he put an end to a lot of that corruption. And that was the biggest problem he faced in England. It's the corruption of the ruling elites. So there's no easy answer, but I think that's what's on President Trump's mind. And I know he's very serious about it. Well, you've said it before, we have the best government money can buy. Yeah. And, <laughs> you know, I think Putin is definitely prepared to keep this war going if we don't move in the direction of talks. But where I want to end it is I know that you're a father. You have so much experience and you've seen this country change over the last uh, several decades. And I was just wondering, you know, do you have hope that it will get better? And and how can we take from this conversation, something that is a call to action and do something? How can the viewers and the listeners um, do something today that will move us in the right direction? I think in the short run, the most important thing you can do is demand accountability from the people who are currently sitting in Washington. I remember vividly when uh, President Obama, surrounded by large numbers of globalist neocons, had been persuaded to put together strike packages for use in Syria which would have expanded the, the ongoing disaster in Iraq to Syria. And when people heard about this, hundreds of thousands, millions of phone calls and messages started pouring in. So by the time he got to the podium, he said, I'm not going to do it. Turned around and walked off the stage. So you can have an impact on these people. But the only way you have an impact is to threaten them with the loss of their office. And that, unfortunately, is, is not always easy to do, but you can make it abundantly clear that war should not be on the table right now for China or Russia, and that our principal focus as a, as a great power today should be to end the war in Ukraine, exactly as President Trump has said, and stop pretending that the Russians are evil. They're not. They're normal people, just as we do, with legitimate security interests. Same thing's true for China. Everyone forgets that Taiwan was the unsinkable aircraft carrier for the Imperial Japanese Armed Forces that invaded China and killed millions of Chinese. We may brush that aside and, and treat that with contempt. We should not. We need to understand other people have legitimate interests. You've got to demand that of the people that you're voting for. But remember, you're competing because you're not paying them. 
Their salary is modest. They're busy stuffing their pockets full of cash from all the lobbyists and the other voices in the background urging them to do stupid things. Somebody said it's not voters who win elections, it's donors. That's the tragedy. Well, it's something we want to change. That's why I'm very passionate about the idea of separating money from the state, if it's possible. Uh, Colonel McGregor, thank you so, so much. You're a voice of reason during times where uh, more common sense and reason is really needed. So thank you so much for all your time. Well, thank you for having me. All right. It's time for another short break to hear these messages from my sponsors. First up, Bitcoin Conference 2023, the world's largest Bitcoin conference, is returning to Miami Beach from May 18th to May 20th. Day one is industry day with a focus on business-minded panels and discussions plus top-tier networking opportunities. General admission days two and three are open to all pass holders and feature panels, keynotes, and workshops with speakers like Michael Lewis, Michael Saylor, Jack Maulers, Lynn Alden, Arthur Hayes, and more plus some exciting new additions like the inaugural Bitcoin games and the mining village and the return of pitch day. I highly recommend this conference. It's what launched my career. And if you want to come, just head to b.tc slash conference and use the code HODL, H-O-D-L for 10% off. I'll see you in Miami beach. Next, I'd love to share crowd health, a Bitcoin alternative to health insurance. Health insurance costs can be sky high today, and you send your money every month to a massive corporation, the health insurance black hole, and if you don't need any health care, you never see the money again. But if you do need a doctor, you end up having to pay even more out of pocket, especially if you end up as one of the 20% of claims on average that aren't covered. With CrowdHealth, you pay a small monthly fee that goes into an account that you accrue over time and is yours to use or keep if you ever leave. You can even save that money in Bitcoin. CrowdHealth is all about community and the community crowdfunds everyone's health care. So if something happens to you or you have a doctor visit, CrowdHealth negotiates down the medical bill lower than what insurance would be, and then the community helps you cover it. And in turn, you can help others cover their needs. For more information, you can head to joincrowdhealth.com slash Natalie. And if you use promo code Natalie, you get six months for $99. Thank you so much for checking out this episode of Coin Stories. Again, hit like on the video and make sure that you have those notifications on so you don't miss out on any new episodes. And I would love to hear from you. If you have suggestions, feedback, guest requests, please email me at natalie at talkingbitcoin.com. Thanks so much.